Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me to your celebration. Uh, happy anniversary, uh, geologists and geosurvey people. You will notice immediately that I am not a geologist nor a geosurvey person, so uh, what I never do is to tell specialists what their specialty is about. So I will not talk about your specialty, but about something that I think is relevant for the work that you are doing. Maybe I'll give my one minute introduction to what the European Environment Agency is doing. We are part of the EU institutions. We are located in Copenhagen since 1994 and we have three essential tasks. We work with the member states on collecting data and monitoring the state of the environment and climate. And we do that based on then an analysis of that data and we benchmark that against uh, policies. We want to know whether uh, member states are doing what they are supposed to do or not. Yeah? The second thing we do is connecting the dots. That is integrated assessments. What is, for example, the impact of a shift towards more renewable systems on resource use and on resource value chains and how does that relate to Europe? That's connecting the dots. And then the third thing we do is we are one of those organizations that connects science to an established knowledge uh, system that is specialized in speaking to policymakers, and that's uh, how we integrate science. Now we have an MOU with you, yeah, and that goes back quite some time. And as a European Environment Agency, I have to say when I checked, uh, you beat us by two years in producing a report that was called Geology and the Environment in Western Europe in 1992. And we were only established in 94 when we came out with our first State and Outlook of the Environment report in Europe. I can say at that moment there was no overlap. Yeah? They were two completely separate things. You then expanded into the rest of Europe, as did we. Uh, the illegible graph here uh, illustrates how more and more member states entered the EU system and started to work with us to produce uh, their type of reports. We have, over the years, started to share some data sets and work on integrating data in, especially on our side, trying to integrate your type of data and knowledge into the assessments that we do. And the type of assessments we do in the State and Outlook of the Environment report result in this. This is the synoptic view of our latest report. We call this the piano of the European environment, yeah? where every key on the piano represents a policy domain for which we have data and on which we make an assessment of the evolution of the past years. And we also look forward the outlook to 2030. And uh, what is obvious is that the outlook doesn't look too good. The green almost disappears. And this is in Europe, where we have the most advanced, most integrated, most ambitious, best implemented environmental policy system on the planet. Yeah? So if this is the future, it didn't look very good when we did the analysis. Yeah? You, you sort of lose confidence in what we are doing. And this actually was the knowledge base, and it's mentioned as that explicitly in the European Green Deal, because our conclusion was we shouldn't do better what we are doing, we should do things differently into more systemic transition logics. And that is deeply embedded in the European Green Deal. Now, we checked for the overlap with data of your type, if I could call it that way, and, uh, well, before, we didn't really integrate it, now very little, and our analysis is that there were limited topics that we traditionally look at that had data availability that covered Europe and that was easily integratable with our type of data. Yeah? Now, it doesn't need to stay that way. Um, I think the, what we can do together in the future is probably going to strengthen our type of assessment and is probably going to be a strong avenue for your type of data to be integrated in maybe a bit more accessible uh, data and knowledge systems. Because I spoke to a couple of you during uh, lunch. I have to say the geological and geosurveys community is not extremely well known. 
you are a bit of a, a club that people ask, and what are these people doing? Where are you giving a talk? Uh, how is that relevant for us? So I think we, we can be meaningful for each other in strengthening uh, the message. Yeah. But that means we also need to understand, and I'll refer to the previous uh, intervention uh, by Nicola, uh, we need to understand what we are dealing with in terms of problems. Uh, and in, if you think of systems problems, I refer to wicked problems as a, a framework. By the way, I, I like the history of, of thoughts and theory. This is from 1973, one year after the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment and two years after the Club of Rome Limits to Growth report, they already were framing the type of messages that we are still trying to frame. Yeah? And that is that we are dealing with a type of problems that straddle organizational and disciplinary boundaries. And I think geology is a field of study that almost by definition does that. Yeah? Uh, it's also where every wicked problem is connected to others. Yeah? When we think of the use, for example, of the underground, which by the way is very poorly governed, from a governance perspective. We did a seminar on that, governing the underground, and it was not on mafia organizations. Huh? Um, so we, there's very poor governance of that. But in order to do that, you need to reflect on, okay, what are you putting there? What are you extracting there? How does it interact? And is one thing not causing a problem for the next thing? Your specialty, but we dove into that with uh, our colleagues at ETH, the geology department. Uh, they're really interesting, yeah? Another interesting uh, thing is that solutions are not right or wrong, but better or worse. And I think we're at a stage in dealing with multiple crises on this planet where we really have to accept that science is not coming with the right solution, but that we are trying to navigate a world that we increasingly call VUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And what do we do as scientists in that type of world? What is the value of the knowledge? that we are bringing, and what can geo surveys and geologists bring to that world. I like to make things a bit more complex, so I'll enter also in super wicked problems, huh? where time is running out. That's what climatologists, ecosystem scientists are telling us. Time is running out. Now, time, I think, is a really interesting concept when you are a geologist. Yeah? I think most people, if they had a geology or geography course in high school, will think of, oh, those are the people who talk about billions of years ago, eh? Carl Sagan, uh, when you are my age. Yeah? But I think what, what, how can your discipline be extremely relevant in the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years? And we have, we have made a lot of promises in the next 30 years. I'll come to those. So what also... Uh, Policies discount the future irrationally. Okay. What do you have to say about prospective geology in uh, that type of discussions? Yeah. Those seeking to solve the problem are also causing it. Uh, your field tends to have a couple of connections to industrial sectors that are part of the problem, and, and, but that are the dominant players in the systems of society that we need. How do we think about that? Those are really important issues, at least in my opinion. At the agency, we organize a lot of our knowledge now around four key systems of provision, food, energy, mobility, and the built environment. Yeah. All of them, of course, have a deep connection to your specialization, uh, if for nothing else, that they require resources and that the use of those resources have a serious impact on the environment and on climate. Yeah. And now, if we want to move to a society that is rather different, we are using the transitions paradigm, where landscape elements like climate change, but also war in Ukraine that has a profound impact on resources yeah, and how we think about resources, where that puts pressure on regimes, for example, the energy regime yeah, or the built environment regime, and where we are looking for niche innovation that we can then scale up to come to a new regime. Yeah? Uh, this type of framework is now also used in the International Resource Panel. I'm a member of that panel. I'm the lead coordinating author of the next Global Resource Outlook report. And we are also looking at reconfiguring 
our resource use in light of creating well-being for 10 billion people, staying within planetary boundaries, and a logic of societal justice, because we know that resource flows on this planet have impacts that are extremely unequally distributed and that have uh, impacts, especially in the first stages of resource use, in those places where we dig them up and do the first stages of working with them. So th these are the types of issues we are thinking about. Now, a lot of that in Europe is landing in the European Green Deal. We support the European Green Deal on a number of topics. There is nothing explicitly there that is looking as if you are linked to it. Yeah? But I think that is not true, actually. Uh, I think, actually, that environmental geology, if I could call a subfield in that way, I see some people nodding, so I guess as a non-geologist I'm maybe not that far off. I think there is a cross-cutting dimension running through it. Circular economy, by definition, is a resource issue. But uh, promoting an energy system that responds to climate targets is also, of course, a resource issue. Uh, the Austrian Environment Agency has made a sort of first analysis of the natural resource needs of the new infrastructure that is needed to go to net zero. I mean, really interesting types of analyses. Yeah? So I think we can do more together if we reflect on where it is connected in a system and not in a fragmented knowledge approach. Which means that we do this, yeah? We make WISE, BICE, FICE, the water information system for Europe, the forest information system for Europe, uh, WISE Marine, I mean, that's what we do, yeah? You, of course, do this, yeah? Uh, do they speak to each other? Is there any connection there? Is, I mean, that is, really, that is really a question, I think. And I think they should speak to each other more. And I, I was uh, speaking uh, to your chair or president or executive. I don't know what the official title is. I'm sorry, I forgot. Secretary General. That sounds very good for an executive director. Uh, we were speaking. And maybe it's time to look at uh, a renewed version of this MOU from a very pragmatic perspective. Uh, because MOUs, when you read the first three pages of them, they bring tears to your eyes usually, uh, because I'm, I mean, we're fabulous what we're all going to do together. Uh, so I told our team, please, yes, let's make a new MOU, but let's look at what it is we are going to do together in the next five years that can support this agenda and that we can connect directly to the European Green Deal, because that's where we need to make connections, in my opinion. Yeah. That means that we can continue working together on core areas like water, uh, where our teams know each other, but it's not always so easy to come with uh, data that is the most useful, the most appropriate, but I'm sure we can uh, improve there. That also means that maybe some of the stuff we are doing, because we are coordinating the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, and we came up with a new product, uh, a ground motion service, that might be really interesting for you and for us because we now have these images, but we are not specialists in understanding why this is happening. That's what you are specialists in. So if we can bring together knowledge, I think we can really advance the use of what we are all investing in. And all that means the European citizen, uh, because in, I mean, we are funded by European citizens. The same is true for uh, the link between all sorts of things that you are specialized in, but that have an impact on the status and on the quality of the environment, of waterways, of soils, of land. And in the European policies, soil and land at this moment are absolutely critical. Yeah? So, the more we can know about that, and the JRC is in the lead there, there is a big investment also uh, funded by RTD, but we're also connected to it, especially through a climate and environment lens. If we can make connections in the future, I think we would collectively be much better off. Yeah? So we have a number of 
complementary goals. Uh, you are interested in the environment uh, since a long time, before we existed. We are interested in it. We're interested in solutions, transition dynamics, and in every single transition dynamic, I think resources play a critical role. And your discipline, your surveys, are closely connected to resource use, the, their use in the life cycle. So raw materials, obviously, we look at that for evident reasons also in the international resource panel, but also energy solutions, which are badly needed, uh, groundwater, which plays a critical role in all sorts of uh, bio and ecological systems. By the way, the protection of biotopes is very high in the new biodiversity strategy. Is there something like the protection of geotopes? Uh, I don't know, uh, but maybe the two are rather connected in some uh, areas. So th there is quite a lot that I think would be meaningful. Um, what I wanted to end with, and I'll not take you too much through this, but we are moving into a time period where if we want knowledge to be effective in transitions, we need to reflect on a transition of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and that means we need to reflect much more on how we can integrate knowledge rather than fragment it. And I know that academic disciplines are super well organized in disciplines, sub-disciplines, sub-sub-disciplines. You all have your five journals, you know your colleagues, and that can lead to a brilliant career. I was a professor at Leuven before, so I know how it works. But I think we are challenged now by times when multiple crises that are interconnected are forcing us to think much more in a knowledge system that is integrating, that has the capacity to be forward-looking and not only trying to explain the past, which is useful in and of itself, and a system where we are looking much more to actionable and solution-oriented knowledge. And for me, that means that we need to think in terms of knowledge systems and knowledge architecture. And where we operate, that I think is shaping up nicely. If I can be very honest, even on your uh, celebration, I think there is quite a scope for improvement, scope for doing more together between your community and our community. And that is, a, that is a commitment that I think should come from both sides. I'm not saying that we are grand at it, we're not, uh, but let's explore a bit what we can do better together. Um, if for nothing else, um, it is because we are living in times where science is telling us that we are running out of time we are paying the price because we see irreversible damage, loss and damage it's called in climate science. We are seeing tipping points in earth systems. We are even calling new geological time frames now the Anthropocene. Huh? And we are dealing with a distribution of the impacts of that that is not only ethically unacceptable, but I think also absolutely counterproductive to finding solutions. So if we can put together a better knowledge system, I think we have a better chance of taking our responsibility as knowledge providers in a system that is paying us to exactly play that role. Thank you.